Hey, welcome, guys. I'm just going to uh, give a few instructions before we get started. This is mainly for the students right now, so students, please pay attention uh, how things are going to work. So as you know, we're going to do five minutes of uh, pitch from the audience. Um, the way this is going to work is we're going to uh, basically start with uh, team one, which is we're basically going alphabetical order of city of medicine. It's going to be the first team. All the other teams are going to go to a holding room so that you, you don't have to watch and be nervous about someone else's presentation, right? So City of Medicine will start here first, and then uh, Edgecombe, we're going to bring them in next, and we're just going to keep going alphabetical until all the teams are done, okay? Once, you're, once you come back in, you'll stay in the room after you've given your presentation, okay? So we have a uh, clicker that controls the slides. So the right button clicker moves the slides forward, okay? It's pretty simple. And I've, we've got all the presentations here on the laptop, and we can, we'll work on getting the slides changed. Don't worry about that. I'll take care of that, okay? Also, uh, use the microphone when you're speaking. We are recording this, uh, so make sure you're using the microphone while you're speaking so we can get uh, good audio of what you're, what you're saying. All right, does anybody have any students? Do you have any questions? All right, you can have just a couple more minutes before we get started. Welcome to our 2015 Innovation Challenge. Yes. I'm Daryl Kane. I'm very excited to welcome you today. We're going to have a great time listening to some great and innovative ideas from students across North Carolina. So today we're going to, I'm going to briefly walk you through a history of uh, the Innovation Challenge. We're going to introduce our, uh, our VIPs, our very important people that are here, and also introduce our guests. So this idea started around April of last year. We had a planning session down at HQ Raleigh. And one of our esteemed guests, Christopher Gergen, will be talking here in a moment. He actually invited us down and we started brainstorming together, how can we cr create and improve uh, entrepreneurial thinking across our network of schools in North Carolina? So we brought in a team of students, teachers, and entrepreneurs. We had a half day planning session and we came up with the idea of running the Innovation Challenge. So what happened after that, we basically did an interest webinar. We gave a training session on what does design thinking look like. We informed us, the schools and the teachers and students about what the challenge would look like. And then we basically put out a call for proposals. And by the, the end of the uh, session, we ended up with 22 applications. And as you can see today, we had 19 final for proposals from 11 schools. Hopefully you guys saw some of those flowers around your schools. I mean, that inspired you to, to participate. We've also had a great interest from our industry partners. We're actually going to hear from one of our industry partners from Cisco here in a little bit. I'll be introducing him in a moment. We had a lot of local mentors that helped local teams to uh, improve and, and to refine their ideas. And then we had uh, industry judges, uh, industry panel judges, they looked at all the proposals and videos. So those are higher education professionals and also industry professionals from, from uh, leading organizations across North Carolina. And we have uh, three judges here today, which I'll be introducing here, them in a little bit, but those are the organizations they're with, Blue Cross Blue Shield, First Citizens Bank, and RTI. And here are our, st our finalists. So give yourselves a hand for making it to the final. I'm gonna turn it over to Christopher just for a few comments. Great, uh, so I just wanted to piggyback on what Daryl said. This is 
come a long way in terms of an idea, and it's always fun to see a dream turn into, turn into action, which is one of the reasons that we're so excited that you all are here. And one of the things that we really want to try to imbue in terms of your involvement in this effort, that this is a lifelong journey. This is the beginning, I think, of what will become hopefully a very dynamic path of being a high impact leader, not only in North Carolina, but beyond, right? And part of it comes down to the entrepreneurial mindset. It's having both the confidence and the competence to be able to take a set of ideas and put them into action. So the fact that you've made it this far is a testament to the fact that you already have that entrepreneurial mindset, and now it's time to flex those muscles. But like any muscle, it actually requires a lot of hard work. You gotta get out there, you gotta try it again and again and again. And a lot of startups fail, right? And not all of you are gonna make it to the very finals of this, but all of you have taken the important steps to be able to get to this point. And what ex is exciting about this, and Tony and I were just talking about this, Tony is the CEO of uh, North Carolina New Schools, is that you are at the leading edge of where we hope the rest of North Carolina will go. Uh, and what we're seeing the rest of the country and the rest of the world go, is that the leaders who are able to take a set of ideas and be able to lead with others to put those ideas into action, are they gonna be the people who are gonna be really able to make the kind of difference we need in our communities, in our state, in our country. So congratulations on getting there. I do wanna let you know that you are not alone in this journey. And you've not only had tremendous support in the school itself, but that you're entering into a world that is going to hopefully embrace the entrepreneurial mindset. You've already got four organizations here who get that. So whether you decide to launch your own company or whether you're good at putting those ideas into action, it will make you more marketable to go out and get a great job or go out and do great things in the world. There are also organizations like ours. So I started an organization called HQ Raleigh, which support, supports entrepreneurs in the community. You also do that in Durham with Bull City Forward and HQ Greensboro in Greensboro and Queen City Forward in Charlotte and Moore Forward in Moore County. So there's a lot of exciting things that are out there to plug into along the way. So be aware of those things as you go. Keep your eyes wide open. There's a terrific quote by a guy named Carlos Castaneda, who is a, who is a great poet. And he basically says, we are all surrounded by the cubic centimeters of chance, and it's the warrior who has the speed and the prowess to pick it up. So congratulations for getting this far. Good luck on this presentation, and remember to be able to embrace this level of confidence and competence to put these ideas into action. Thanks, Chris, for those great words. So I'm going to introduce our judges here briefly. So we have uh, Allison Bonner, a communication specialist from Blue Cross Blue Shield. So Allison, here, let's give her a hand. Thank you. So Allison is responsible for developing high quality strategic communication plans to broaden eternal awareness and understanding of HR initiatives across various departments, including wellness benefits, performance management, employee relations, and diversity. Allison was the previous wellness coordinator designing and implementing wellness programs for over 4,800 employees with a 92% participation rate. So thanks for being here, Allison. Uh, next we have Stella Lamb from RTI. Stella. <laughs> Stella is a program manager in uh, internships and student engagement and university co collaborations. Uh, she founded the internship program at RTI in 2011, and she helped develop the talent pipeline for a future global workforce. She now manages the RTI internship program, which has grown to host over 150 undergraduate and graduate level interns annually in the United States and internationally. Thank you, Stella, for being here. And last but not least, we have Kathy Russell. Yes, Kathy's from First Citizens Bank. She's an experienced corporate recruiter specializing in non-traditional financial roles, such as insurance, leasing, mortgage sales, credit, treasury, strategy, and international roles. She's also the co-chair of the Panther Creek Business Advisory Board. Kathy, thank you for being here. And of course, we don't want to forget our, our sponsors for the 25, 2015 uh, Innovation Challenge. Cisco Systems is our sponsor today. So we want to thank you guys for being here. We'll hear from uh, Sanjay Powell here in a little while at the end of the program. And Christina O'Neill has helped organize the event as well. So thank you guys for being here. Look forward to hearing your remarks. All right, with that said, I think we are ready to get started. So we're gonna have uh, the City of Medicine Academy stay in the room and all the other students can exit out with uh, Mr. George Ward there and we'll be getting started here in a few moments.
Test it. We still on here? Still on? Okay. And we are here to present to you our Innovation Challenge project called Loose to Win. At first, this project didn't seem particularly unusual because of the fact that we do go to a health school. But it was difficult because we were asked to focus just on Durham and take a big health problem and focus it on one city. But then it hit me when I was on a bus on my way to school and I seen a man that was wearing red shirt and black pants riding on a scooter on a sidewalk because he was obese. And I was thinking, well, maybe that if I hadn't been asked to focus on Durham, I wouldn't have noticed him, but that day I did. But that's when the hard part came. Why did you notice? Because it was real to us. But even if it was real, it still doesn't know how hard it actually was. Until we actually did the research. And that is a lot. <laughs> Every one out of ten people in Durham have diabetes. We are ranked eighth in the nation of people with diabetes. And that's how we knew that solving this problem was very important. Information, personalization, and motivation. In our blog, we provide information about obesity and diabetes and different ways that you can control it. And last but not least for information, we provide a survey in our app that no, not only gives you the chance to tell us about yourself, but gives you the chance to ask any questions that you may have. For personalization in our app, we provide two different kinds of videos. One video for workouts and another video for recipes that you may use or watch as you please. And that's where the app, where the Google Plus and the chat room come in. This allows you to communicate with other people that are doing or going through the same things that you are. It allows you to motivate each other to work out and to eat healthy.
and we know that this app can make a tremendous impact on Durham. People are already visiting our app and our website because there is a need out there that Loose to Win can provide. And in North Carolina. In essence, the uses of our app will become a community of fellow supporters to sustain our app itself. We are committed to changing Durham for the better. Okay. We have seen this need in Durham and we know that we can change it. Basically, I know that it's going to be up for a while because every once in a while I'll check and see how many people are visiting it, and I would think that as long and I post every other day, so as long as people are visiting it, I think it's going to be okay. And I saw people get it like a month ago. Hi, we're the STEM Club from Edgecombe Early College High School. I'm Taylor. I'm Emily. I'm Sarah. And I'm Brianna. The first thing we're going to talk to you today is about statistics. In North Carolina, the poverty rate is 17.9%. Of that percentage, the people who are affected the most are the children. 
one in four children don't know where the next meal is coming from. Next is the food insecurity rate, 17.3%, and it's increasing each year. The government tries to help with programs like the food assistance program, but 81% of the people in that program don't know where the food comes from. And if they don't know where it comes from, then they don't know what they're eating. Another way the government tries to help is with the WIC program, which stands for Women, Infant, and Children Supplemental Nutrition Program. Nearly 245,000 women and children are enrolled in this program. And the food that they can buy with the WIC tickets are steadily decreasing in value. And the only things that they can purchase are the cheap goods, and they don't provide the nutrition that the mothers and children need. Here are our goals to help and decrease the malnutrient problem in the community. We would like to grow and donate at least 50 pounds of vegetables, and we would like to grow cucumbers, snaps, okra, peppers, carrots, and potatoes, just to name a few. We would also like to grow 50 pounds or more of fruits and donate those as well. And we would like to grow tomatoes, blueberries, strawberries, and apples. We would also like to grow things like flowers, like pansies, dogwood, daisies, roses, and sunflowers. When we sell them, we're going to donate 70% of our profits to the outreach center. The 30% of our profit that we don't donate will be used to help to sustain and upkeep the garden. And the first thing that we do when we start this plan is that we're going to help and plot and prepare a piece of land with our community leaders. Now we've already worked with our college liaison to secure a piece of land that we can use for our upcycled community garden. The next thing we do is ask our community to bring in any unwanted items through our junk drive. With anything that we get, we're gonna use those items as pots for our plants and upcycle them so we can plant our food. The next step is to actually purchase the plants and seeds we're going to use. We can either raise some money to buy the seeds or ask people in our community if they have any flowers or plants that they want us to grow in our garden. The next step is to set up the garden. We're going to place everything in its rightful place, then we're going to like put, start planting our plants and seeds. After we set up the garden, we as the STEM club and volunteers from our school will work together to upkeep the garden by keeping it running smoothly. Next, we're going to ask the community to become involved with the garden by um, attending classes and volunteering to help keep it running. And they'll also learn where their food comes from. Once we actually grow the plants and fruit, we're going to take the if we reach our goal, when we reach our goal, we're going to take the food and take it to the Tarbo Community Outreach Center so they can help feed the community. Next, we're going to evaluate. We're going to see how, come, how far we've come close to our goals. We're going to look at the benefits, and then we're going to make some adjustments if we can to make it even better. After we make all the adjustments needed, evaluate it, we're going to do it again. Why do we want to do this? Tarboro is such a close-knit community. And the people that go hungry each night, their stomachs aren't the only things that are hurting. It's our hearts. They hurt because those are our friends that are suffering. We thank you for your time. Do you have any questions? We haven't sorted that out yet with our college liaison. Well, we have many people from our community that are experienced gardeners, and we ourselves have also worked in gardens before. So we're going to rely on the experience of our community and of ourselves. Thank you. 
we hope to raise a couple hundred dollars, maybe two hundred dollars or more. Well, at our school, we have a service learning program, and we're also hoping to start a garden club once we start this up. So we'll have a steady supply of people to come and help us. We hope this idea will catch on with other communities. Simplify your questions a little bit. <laughs> Not to put you on the political uh, spot, but I was on this one. <laughs> All right. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Yanelli Ruiz. I'm Morella Perez. My name's Anna Lee. And I'm Rose Hine. And we're from the Johnson County Early College Academy. So, weight is a big problem. Half, being overweight or obese is the second leading cause of preventable death. Two-thirds of American adults are overweight. And in 2012, more than one-third of American children were obese. America is the most obese country in the world. Project I End Obesity uses three simple steps to end obesity in America. One person at a time. Step one is to inform. We have to get information about healthy eating out there. And what's so great about this program is that it's student oriented. So what we plan to do is to have students from local schools to teach other students in their middle schools and high schools. Next, the volunteers arrange one-on-one -on -one sessions to personally mentor students, helping them become healthier. The program's third part, however, is the best. Students who have been taught and mentored will go home and tell their parents and friends all about the program. In addition, they restart the circle by telling and teaching and mentoring students in their local middle and high schools. Why Project I in Obesity? Well, it encourages healthy eating, exercise, and living habits. It allows students to teach other students. It incorporates community service and is perfectly designed for the community and families. It provides an innovative solution to a modern problem, and it's 100% self-sustainable. The project sustainability depends upon the third step, the restarting the mentorship program with the health, new healthy students. This is an incredible way to keep the project going. It's free and it's beneficial for those who are involved, allowing them to get community service hours. This will help the students gain presenting, public speaking, and leadership skills. The community service that they gain can go to beta clubs, senior projects, and even college acceptance. We have begun working to get Project I in Obesity into schools in our county 
but have realized that we need someone to guide us in the making of a curriculum for our mentors to use. This is where you all come in. With the help of each and every one of you, we can make a difference. Project I and Obesity will, one step and one American at a time, make our communities healthier. And while it's working, this project will make students in America better leaders so everyone can make a better tomorrow. Thank you, and we look forward to working with you. Any questions? That's how I see it originally starting, but I'd also like to use social media aspects to encourage it. So it's going to kind of be like a, almost a popular thing to do, hopefully. It's structured basically as a mentorship program. It starts with a student inside a classroom who basically for maybe one day of a class will teach basically a health education class. Then after that, once they've gotten the basic information out there, they'll talk to individual students in individual sessions to further guide them into making healthy, personalized choices for their lives. That's what we need to work on because we're not experts on the matter. We need to work with someone who is so that we can make a great curriculum for them to use. I think it could go either way. Um, I guess that high schools could teach high schoolers and middle schoolers could teach middle schoolers and high schoolers could teach middle schoolers, but I don't think middle schoolers could teach high schoolers. I think it can go any way except that one. <laughs> Is this already on? Right. Uh, my name is Colin Garcia. Raul Cruz. I'm Aaron Penny. And I'm Georgia Price. The n our school is Johnson County Early College Academy, and our teacher sponsor is Amanda Rowland. Our innovation is the Grotesque Grocer. OK, I have a question for one of the judges and one of the audience members. Miss Lamb, how many people do you think, how many Americans do you think go hungry each night? Russia. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the correct answer is 50 million. Uh, Y'all are a little high. <laughs> um, <laughs> to put this in perspective, according to the, U the United States Census Bureau, in 2014, the population of North Carolina was roughly 10 million people. The amount of starving people 
is five times greater than the amount of the, the population of an entire state. Over 300 million pieces of produce are wasted annually, and 23.5 million Americans live in areas called food deserts. Food deserts are areas that are dominated by fast food chains such as McDonald's, Wendy's, and Zaxby's. With all these people going hungry, the last thing we need to do is waste food, but Americans generally throw out half the foods that they purchase. With the obesity rate rising in ex the obesity rate in America is rising exponentially, and eating unhealthy comes with serious long-term risks such as diabetes, heart disease, and even cancer. Americans are not eating their recommended levels of fruits and vegetables, and the main reason for that is the accessibility and affordability of healthy produce. People in poverty tend to become obese, while healthy foods are left to rot every day. We have administered a survey of 69 people. Nine out of 10 said that healthy foods were expensive. 93% of the people said that they would change their eating habits if healthy foods were more cheaper. More than half said that they would throw out deformed fruits or vegetables just simply because of their looks. Our mission as the grotesque grocer is to obtain deformed produce from our local farmers and then sell them for 30% to 40% discount in grocery stores or food stands in low-income food deserts and around our community. Well, why these low-income food deserts? Because they are full of extremely popular, extremely cheap, and very expensive, or no, very unhealthy fast food chains. And what this does is it's going to make produce very expensive in these areas. People don't want to buy them. They're too expensive, so they'd rather go to a fast food stand, spend a dollar, and get a hot dog. Our food stands and grocery stores would not only sell the grotesque foods, but they would also contain samples of produce slices, smoothies, and even food cooked on site with our produce. The closest example we have is like at Sam's Club. This would increase the education of people with techniques of healthy eating, and it's going to promote a good diet all around the board. The deformed produce has the exact same nutritional value as their perfect counterparts, so why should we waste them? We should not let them rot. We should take them and do something with them. This idea would allow for people to eat healthy without eradicating their budget. This is going to increase accessibility, and it's going to promote education to eat healthy. Additionally, this would also promote farmers. It's going to give them an income for something that they would usually use as waste, and it's going to increase local grocery store businesses because it's going to make produce a lot cheaper. The cheaper the produce, the more demand there is. This is going to bring business to these businesses. In order to have a successful program, we need a way to sustain it. This will be done by dividing the proceeds. Proceeds will be partitioned four ways. 30% will go to the generous farmers who supply our produce. This money will serve as an incentive for them to continue supplying our produce, and it will also cover any extra labor costs. The next 30% will go to the grocery stores and farmers markets who house and sell our produce, as well as the food stands we create in food deserts to sell produce. 25% will go back into our program to keep it running. We need a solid foundation to maintain the program, so this portion of the proceeds will serve as just that. The final 15% will be donated to charities involving food accessibility and health. With this, we'll be helping bring awareness to multiple issues at once. By maintaining our program and supporting others, we can make North Carolinians and ultimately Americans healthier and provide them with cheaper produce. If we begin by spreading this idea throughout Johnston County in North Carolina and eventually expand it to the United States, we can reach our ultimate goal of erasing food deserts. Of course, these percentages are not set in stone and we are willing to negotiate. We need your help to implement the grotesque grocer. Thank you for listening to our presentation and we, hope we look forward to hearing that you have accepted our proposal. Thank you. Well, first, we got to look at where our local farmers are. And once we find them, we try to get them on board to sort of like donate at the beginning, but they're eventually going to get funded for it if they want to. But they could donate their vegetables and fruits that are deformed to us. They would usually throw them away, and then they would probably give them to us, and we'd put them in food stands, or if there's grocery stores in the area, we would use them and promote their businesses while doing this. Um, 
Um, well, I mean, we could have a volunteer program, but also we could do it if we really wanted to. Or with that money we donate, or that money we put to this program, we could hire people. And if they really don't want payment, they don't have to have payment if they want to do it. Um, for this, what we're going to do is for each food stand, we're going to start in Johnson County. So if we're starting in Johnson County, we're going to have local farmers just from Johnson County. Um, they will start by donating this so we can provide transportation for the produce. and Or if they would like to, they could. Because they will eventually have some funding for that because we will have that 30% that's going to go to them. And that will include like the extra labor cost. Any more questions? Welcome to Foods. Oh, sorry. Welcome to Foods 101. Today we are representing Johnson County Early College Academy. My name is Cameron Giddens. My name is Paula Galvan. My name is Tyler Gordon. I'm Ariana Morgan. So what's the problem? America is one of the most obese countries in the world. According to a study done by Business Insider in 2014, we were ranked the, the number one obese country in the world. Um, the percentage of children ages 6 to 11 who are obese in America went from, from 7% in 1980 to 11% in 2012, to 18% in 2012. This is an 11% increase in thir 32 years. There are many risk factors that come with obesity. It, as, of as of 2014, 7% of obese youth have at least one risk factor, fa factor of getting cardiovascular disease. People simply do not have the, the means to cook healthy, whole foods. Instead, they choose greasy foods high in fat. This is because it's often more convenient. Studies show that binge eating, though, makes a similar addiction to drug addiction, how it's just consistent, you can't stop. And according to the, according to the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention, over one-third of teenagers and kids are either overweight or obese. That's children and adolescents who are obese or overweight have a higher risk of being ill in bone, psychological, also social issues, all of that. What is wrong with teenagers? Teenagers that are obese are more likely to get develop prediabetes. Prediabetes is a condition in which the blood glucose levels indicate a high risk for the development of diabetes. We plan to make a class that will focus on food that is good for everyone. It will teach children about healthy living. This innovation will expand the children's knowledge about the diseases that can form from eating unhealthy foods. That, uh, benefits that the children will get are that they will learn facts su um, such as knowing the risks of eating unhealthy and healthy diets. They will learn healthy food options, how to live a healthy lifestyle, 
and and there will be food pyramids in the class that will help children throughout the period and they will be used as a reference for children to look back through. The class will mostly focus on interactive learning because the children need to observe why unhealthy eating is not a good thing. An example would be that there would be uh, two bodies with different physical compositions and the children would explore what is going on inside to see if there are any health risks. If there are any, which there will be, they will investigate and explore the short and long-term effects of unhealthy eating. They will there will also be parent meetings and parent nights that will allow the parents to observe what is going on in the class. There are, however, going to be some kids that do not like healthy eating and not like the class, but we ensure you that with the facts and knowledge they obtain, they will be motivated to learn more about food. Also, children who learn about food in the class will most likely tell their parents when they get home, and they will later integrate to the food diet. As this passes on through children and their families, the children will start to integrate the foods they are eating into their diets. This will keep going along and along, families among families, through this point when both children and adults, both eating healthier, everybody wins. This proves the sustainability of our project. Everyone who eats a more healthy diet becomes more energetic and happy from this diet. Just think about the creativity that everyone had to create foods that are that look good and taste delicious. This is Foods 101. Thank you for listening. Yes, that will be like kind of like an elective class. When you're in the elementary school, there's um, it'll start from preschool and then in the eighth grade. And in preschool, they'll have um, a lot of like they they won't have like notes, but it'll be more interactive, and you can draw and paint the body and things like that. Well, first we want to start here, and then as it progresses, it could grow and expand to wherever like the school system wants it to go. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Alan Batista, and we are Project Game Changer, and these are my colleagues. I'm Chris Adams. Alana Almeida. And I'm Florence Yalmanzor. <coughs> Health problems that come as a result of poor diet are high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and high blood sugar. It can also lead to type 2 diabetes, strokes, cancer, or even pregnancy problems when they're older. The way we eat is vital to our health, and the habits we pick up as children can follow us for the rest of our lives. Most schools fail to educate kids on the importance of eating healthy. Approximately 17%, that is 12.7 million children and adolescents between the ages of 12 and 19, are obese. Okay, so our solution is basically to make a game which will subconsciously and consciously teach children the effect of 
healthy and unhealthy eating. The premise of the game will be you will be the server at a restaurant. The restaurant will have four main patrons. Two of those patrons will be healthy and two will be unhealthy. The unhealth of the healthy ones, one will continue to eat healthy. He'll eat the low fat foods and he'll eat the low fat foods and other stuff like that. And he'll continue to be healthy while the other healthy patron He'll indulge in the high carb, high fat foods, and you'll see him gradually go from a healthy state jogging in the restaurant to an unhealthy state where he's walking at a slower and slower pace. The two unhealthy patrons, one will eat healthy and he'll make better decisions and he'll come in, you know, gradually faster. He'll have more energy. He'll come more and more. And sadly, the last patron, he'll, in his unhealthy ways, continue to eat unhealthy and he'll get worse and worse to the point where he stops coming in due to health complications. Now, you may be wondering why this is going to work. Well, we have three main reasons as to why we believe this idea will work. Our first is that the healthy benefits will turn into a habit. Studies have shown that sub the, sub the subconscious actions later turn into habits. If kids, early, if kids play this game early enough and they learn what the, um, what the consequences are of eating unhealthy. They'll start eating healthier, and this will continue on into their adult life. An example of this is the game Tetris. Tetris is a game where blocks fall from the sky and you organize them in the correct way. Um, people who have played this game are shown to be more organized than those who do not play the game. Um, and uh, by, this, by this study, it shows that playing the game has become a habit for them, a way of life. And this is what we hope for them, for our game to do with other, with like people to like, it become a habit for them not to go to a fast food restaurant and it'll hopefully benefit them. Our second point is that they'll be informed. The kids while playing the video game will learn what eating healthy and what eating unhealthy can do to a person. And our third point is that they'll have more skills. Some examples of these are following directions and hand-eye coordination. It's been proven that playing video games can teach kids skills that they don't normally learn in school. In our video game, they will be doing high-level thinking, and they will be learning what to do in the kitchen. Thank you for your time, and that is all. We hope you enjoyed our idea, and we hope you choose it. What we see this as is more of like um, after school, once well, once they're done with their work, they can go into the computer lab, maybe on free days, and they can go in and do that as like their free time to play. Computer room. That's how we see like our video game being played, like through the computer, like educational games. Well, the way we plan to sustain our stuff is if the video game gets popular and things go as planned, the main way would be through short advertisements. Have you seen in most video games or online apps where they have little advertisements at the bottom? We would hope to sustain ourselves through stuff like that. No. Those would be able to keep the funds in to keep the video game updated and ran.
Good afternoon, everybody. We sincerely thank you for being here. We appreciate your time. I'm Nathan Russ, that's Madeline Jones, and that's Caleb McMillan. And unfortunately, the fourth member of our group, Madeline Sigmund, could not be here today. We will be presenting you our innovation challenge design, the run for obesity. As a group, when we thought of the idea, encouraging healthy lifestyle in our community, we all immediately thought of obesity and how it's become such a prominent problem in our community today. Just in Wake County alone, 59.9% .9 of adults are considered to be obese or overweight. The U.S. has an even higher percentage, being at 68.9%. That's over half the adults in our country. I don't think that's going to set a very good example for future generations to come. <coughs> to be fair, though, we as a county and a country are not making it any easier on these adults to practice healthy behaviors at home. 51% of restaurants in Wake County are considered to be fast food. On top of that, North Carolina is below the national benchmark for access to recreational facilities. Recreational facilities and their access are extremely important because they can greatly influence people's decision on whether or not to partake in physical activity. Even schools are lowering the amount of physical education brought to our students by reducing the amount of required classes. On top of all the little physical education and overwhelming amount of fast food, families are constantly busy and do not have the time to sit down and have a well-balanced meal, making it even easier to give in to the already overwhelming and obviously easy and cheap fast food. As a result, without the proper influence, we believe that children and adults are not going to be able to practice healthy lifestyles at home. With our solution, we're hoping to change this. Some of the current methods, methods schools are undertaking in order to prevent obesity are mandatory recesses, healthy foods at cafeteria lunches, and weighing kids in PE. Although these methods are effective, our methods are a little bit different. We have a 5K design with stations set up around the track to inform people of the dangers of obesity, such as high in cholesterol, diabetes, heart attacks, etc. The 5K is exercise itself, and it is... Um, it is targeted to all ages, whether you run or walk the 5K. Our solution gives the participants a new outlook on exercise and highlights the benefits of healthy lifestyle. We believe that by informing the people of the negative effects of obesity, that they will be more willing and motivated to live a healthy lifestyle. So we've already talked about the problem, and we briefly discussed the solution. So now it's time to go over the plan. In, this, in the plan overview, we will answer the questions when and where, as well as how we will organize the event. So for starters, we are going to organize a 5K at Wake Med Soccer Park in Cary. Wake Med is a 5K trail that is perfect for runners and is available for rent. We plan to use this for our run. The 5K, pr the 5K pr promotes awareness of obesity and will have slides and will have stations set up around the trail that will give facts and statistics about obesity. These facts and statistics will, give, will tell the harm of obesity in the world. Water will also be set up at each station so that runners who are thirsty may drink. Volunteer and sponsor tents will be set up at the beginning and at the finish line of the trail. Activities will be held after the 5K to promote a healthy lifestyle. We will hold the race annually in fall because the weather at this time is perfect for running. It's not too hot and it is not too cold. As you can see in the screenshot above, we have created a website that outlines our entire project. People may use this website to simply get information about the run or to sign up as a runner, sponsor, or a volunteer. Overall, we put a lot of thought into this plan and we are working hard to overcome obesity in the United States, starting with spreading the word and giving options and solutions in North Carolina. Are there any questions? Well, a lot of that we would plan to be volunteers, but if we can't, we could always hire people with sponsor money. And the renting of the um, 5K trail isn't the full money, so we would still have some leftover money for those kinds of um, for those kinds of facilities. Okay. Well, um, we plan to get some more. Uh, 
popular sponsors so that we could bring more people into the race and just overall just raise awareness for the obesity for obesity and we hope that it just grows and people start actually thinking about obesity and trying to change the future generations i was also going to add that we also have a benefit i think because we're all kind of spread out where we live around in the county so we would be able to reach a broader audience as well Yes, we won't we won't necessarily discount the race, but I think we'll have more participants if they can go at their own pace. They won't have to be rushed, and they can stop at as they please and look at the different stations. <laughs> I was also going to add this race or run more of isn't exactly a race. It's more of a invite your family, your friends, and come have a good time and learn about obesity. But if you don't want to learn about obesity, you can always just go run for fun and try going as fast as you can. Um, we would advertise it just through sponsor words. Uh, we might hand posters around town or hang up posters around town. There are really endless ways that we could do it. We could uh, go online and try and sponsor it. And there are just many ways we could we could do it. Hello, we are students from Yadkin Valley. We are freshman students from Yadkin Valley Regional Career Academy, and we are here today to present to you all our innovation challenge, which is Tarvors, and it consists of seven themes. My name is George Brogdon. My name is Laura Cardoso. My name is Abigail Armis. My name is Braxton Tucker. What is Tar Wars? We were chosen by Lexington Medical Center to create a tobacco-free educational program that will help that'll teach sixth graders about the physical and social effects of tobacco use. We hope to extend this program with six other standards that'll <laughs> that have to do with tobacco use. Why Tar Wars? In our nation, we have many organizations that want to put an end to tobacco use. Here in North Carolina, 20% of teenagers use tobacco. Our program, Tar Wars, will put an end to the tobacco use where it most commonly starts, and that is with teenagers. With being teenagers ourselves, we hope to influence the sixth graders by teaching them the effects of tobacco and because we're close to their age. The sixth graders are entering a point in their lives where they're entering their teenage years, and we hope that our program will influence their decision on whether or, whether or not they want to use tobacco in the future. Tar Wars is different because it provides activities for sixth graders to get a visual on what it's like to be a tobacco user. 
for our first activity, we would pass around a straw and they would do any type of physical activity that they could do while standing for 30 seconds in place. They would then breathe through the straw and it is supposed to show what smoking and trying to do physical exercise is like. For our second activity, we would give we would pass around a cloth that has been used by a frequent smoker and it's supposed to show what they would smell like after heavy smoking. For our third activity, we would pass around a cup and a Tootsie Roll, and they would spit the juice from the Tootsie Roll from chewing it into the cup, and it's supposed to show what doing chewing tobacco is like. We hope to expand our program and not only teaching the sixth graders about the effects of tobacco, but also teaching them on how it affects others, how it affects their success, teaching them about the cost of tobacco, and teaching them about how tobacco companies focus on them trying to get them to use their tobacco products. Is there any questions? We would do this teaching at their schools where we would go to each classroom and present our presentation. We have a slideshow that we made and we would present our presentation to them and teaching them what they would what they need to know about the effects of tobacco. Yes, we could print it out and we could mail it to them so they could use. Well, actually, we, w we had this, we did a focus group with some sixth graders in Lexington where we actually presented our slideshows and they seemed to enjoy it. They were very active and we, they learned a lot from their experience. We did it with three classes of sixth graders. Well, I was uh, pretty blown away by, by, by those presentations. Let's all give them all a great hand. Hmm. Yes. So uh, what we're going to do for the next few minutes, our judges are actually going to exit, and uh, they'll be deciding on uh, who the winners are. So we'll be back in about 15 minutes with the judges. But uh, during that time, we got some great remarks planned by our CEO, Mr. Dr. Tony Habit, and then we have some remarks from our sponsor from Cisco, Sanjay Powell. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Habit. Thank you, Daryl. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so could the students all please stand again? Thank you very much. Your, all those presentations were fascinating. So congratulations to every single one of you for what you did this afternoon in your remarks. I have to say I'm a little bit disappointed about a part of that. You made it really hard for me to go home tonight and have a pepperoni pizza <laughs> and feel good about that. So um, it's going to be really tough to not uh, remember and think about the things that you said and the ideas that you shared uh, this afternoon. Uh, you were asking and thinking about some really big questions and I kept thinking during your presentation that when I was your age, the question that I was asking most was, do you want fries with that? <laughs> you know, my big, experience, <laughs> my big experience was working at McDonald's, and you're going so much deeper in thinking about uh, nutrition, most of you, and health and well-being. So that was really uh, profound uh, and inspiring. So thank you for that. Um, you know, uh, the world that you're uh, moving into is so vastly different than what I knew when I was working at McDonald's and thinking about what my path would, would be like. If you're reading the newspaper or reading the newspaper, going online and watching what's happening, what are the kinds of things that are going on around the world, right? We've got like a growing population. 
We have people moving into cities from rural communities all around the world. And as a result of that, there's greater concentrations of poverty. And some of you talked about the implications for poverty for wellness and health. There's political instability all around the world. And the list of things that have to be solved goes on and on and on. And it almost seems like it's an endless list of things. But your generation and the future that you have must be about how you help us solve those things. And so the work that you've been doing with these teams and the demonstrations you were providing for us, um, we're here to learn from you and to think about if we help many, many more students have these sorts of opportunities, to think about big questions about things that really, really matter, and think about how do we transform education around the things that really, really matter. So those complex problems that are happening in North Carolina, in the United States, all around the world. We have to count on young people like you to feel a sense of confidence and to feel a connection that you have the ability in your town, in our state, in our country, in the world, that you have the ability to affect change. And that's not a small thing, obviously. But what we're trying to use through this innovation challenge is to learn from you and your communities and the adults who support you. Can we grow this again so that it takes place in every school, in every community, so that learning is defined by your creativity and your initiative and the ideas that you create? So really excited about the presentations. Really disappointed about the pizza. <laughs> but I really congratulate you all for what you've shared with us this afternoon. And at this point, I want to thank all the folks who are working with us to make this possible, and there are a long list of them, Cisco included. Sanjay, would you please come up and share your observations with us? Thank you. Well, doesn't it feel good now? All the presentation done, you're breathing easy waiting for the results to come in, a little bit of excitement. You know, I counted six out of eight, maybe five out of eight, talked about obesity and, you know, healthy eating. So following your pizza advice, I'm definitely going to go to the gym more often <laughs> and try to eat healthy, right? But uh, before I talk about a few things, why Cisco, you know, feels really proud to be able to sponsor this event, a couple of tips on... Uh, effective presentation. By the way, all of you did a great job. You know, when you have a monitor where your slides are, are so small, if you're standing all the way back, you can't really see anything. Some of the corporate presentations I do these days, you really have like a 65 inch ultra high definition monitors where you can see. <laughs> so you, you did have a little bit of logistics. Second thing is some of you were trying to look at the cheat sheet, right? When you have a cheat sheet in your hand, why do you have to hide it? So here's my cheat sheet. <laughs> so what do you do with the cheat sheet? Is you try to hide it? You go try to find a podium. Luckily, I'm the only one presenting. So I'm going to go all the way back. I'm going to have it right here. And I may look at it, may not look at it. But at least I know I'll have it. So uh, Cisco, uh, and I've had the pleasure of working with Cisco for a very long time. Uh, in another two weeks, it will be 21 years in the company. Thank you. <laughs> and also, uh, I joined, uh, joined Cisco in 1994. That's the time I moved into North Carolina. And I tell you, uh, the pace at which the entire state of North Carolina has grown, both in terms of size, constructions, attracting different companies, schools, uh, universities, you know, growing in stature. It just have been absolutely, absolutely fantastic to see. So what has driven state of North Carolina to be, you know, become so successful? Now, I would like to think the foundation of that, and in pretty much every presentation of yours, talked about technology. Technology coming in front and center into trying and solve and you talked about obesity, you know, over 60%, somebody said. And there are many other problems that our society faces that technology is going to help solve. But who is going to lead and drive that change? It's all of you right here. Who come with that 
who are growing up with technology right from day one, like as soon as you are able to walk, you know, kids these days are using phones, using iPads, and then you're going, it will become natural for you to have technology part of your system. Unless, unlike people like us, who kind of had to be like, you know, at least in my 20s before I started thinking, hey, this technology thing, something called computers <laughs> come into our lives, uh, kind of making it exciting. So with that in mind, you know, what is going to be the most important area for where the jobs of the future are going to be? What will be the most important measures that will drive the requirements of different jobs and different companies in every industry? Not just the food industry, not just manufacturing, not just oil and rigs. Every industry foundationally will require technology to be successful, which would mean the importance of science, technology, engineering, and math will just go to another level. And there are many, many data points out there where you can look at, we'll talk about by 2020, there'll be so many different jobs out there, and the people are talking in terms of, you know, I've seen a chart from you, Christina, over several million jobs will be available, you know, in the U.S. with students from science, technology, engineering, and math major. And the challenge to achieving degrees in science, technology, engineering, and math is not just knowing these subjects well, you know. I'll share one personal story. Uh, when I was uh, actually in 12th grade, I was studying in India. I was very good in mathematics. And there used to be this award, which was kind of, in, like a better word, called top 1% in mathematics in all of India. You know, India is a some, you know, big country, so big numbers, so top 1% really proud to be there. But the hardest part for me was not to get that top 1% score in mathematics, right? The hardest part was to get that award, you also had to get 60 in English out of 100, which I had never gotten till my 12th grade. So anybody wants to guess how much I got in English in 12th grade? Someone said 60? That's the right answer. <laughs> I got exactly 60 in my 12th grade in, in, uh, in English to get that top 1% award. Math was easy, easy. So that's my point here, you know, as you get the passion to study engineering, to study mathematics, it's not just going to be the factor that you can get good grades in that. What excites you? That's what I loved about all the presentations that all of you showed, which kind of connected the real problems we are facing, but then gave that passion to many of you who are presenting with a lot of enthusiasm and why it's going to be important for our future. Uh, just couple more things, you know, so as we go about just looking at pure statistics, for all the different jobs that we're going to need, they're not going to be enough, like, you know, hopefully no, nobody minds me saying that, they're not going to be enough schools or colleges that can produce that at the pace we need. So how is it going to help? How is it going to happen? It's really going to happen by us mentoring each other, right? How do each one of us mentors more, whether it is fellow students, colleagues, kids we know, you know, people we're hanging out with, that's what it's going to take. So Cisco is going to talk, this is where I'm going to look at my cheat sheets because there are specific dates I need to mention and I can't go wrong, otherwise Christina won't be happy. Uh, we have a number of different uh, events planned, purely keeping in mind that how we can mentor many more of you. Clearly Cisco as a technology company, over 70,000 employees, more than 4,500 just in RTP alone. We have a lot of top technical talent in our company who we are making them accountable to mentor more and more. So one of the first events that we're gonna have is the week of April 20th. We'll be hosting a RTP STEM week where 500 employees uh, we'll be mentoring more than 500 students. And you know, the goal would be to show you some of our labs, show you how technology is being used, and again, get the passion going. Uh, then we're also launching Girls Power Tech as part of Girls in ICT Day, which is gonna happen on April 23rd. Uh, under this initiative, more than 1,000 Cisco employees will mentor 3,000 girls between the age of 13 and 18, and about 100 of them we'll be able to uh, work with right here, you know, in RTP. And then lastly, 
Cisco is also sponsoring a young woman's innovation challenge where young ladies will compete for big cash prizes. How much is that? Oh my goodness, wow, it's big. Uh, regarding how problems can be solved and lives improved by the devices connecting to the internet. And uh, so we invite you know, all the young ladies here in the room uh, to Google Young Women's Innovation Challenge to learn more and apply by May 18th. And in closing, again, I want to thank Cisco, uh, all of you, and Cisco is very proud to be sponsoring this event. Thank you very much. Cisco is an excellent corporate citizen and are involved in education at so many levels in North Carolina. It would be uh, a real loss for us if they were ever to not be here. You're, you're wonderful people. We appreciate you quite, quite a lot. Um, while we're uh, waiting for Simon Cowell and his peers to come back, <laughs> this might be a good time to ask some of the students, and maybe you could come up here and help me do this okay. part. Um, ask some of the students to tell us about the things that you had to do to get your ideas together. Um, was this uh, an easy process for you? How did you figure this out? What steps did you have to take? Uh, all the presentations were really spot on. And thanks for the pitch, by the way. Um, I am glad I didn't use the notes that are in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> had me like this. So could we hear from a couple of the student presenters? Um, would you like a volunteer?
Thank you for the support. Thank you very much. They did a great job. <laughs> All right, so we have a few comments from our judges as we uh, get ready to announce the winners. Uh, we just wanted to say we are so impressed with all of your presentations. It was a very tough decision. We were del delivering for a, a long time. I uh, want to congratulate all of you guys uh, for all your fantastic work. Um, we were very impressed and um, we're excited to tell you all the winners real soon. So if I can have uh, Sanjay and Tony come up. <laughs> well, we're going to start with uh, second place first, and uh, let's see if I can, I don't want to like say it out loud, so let me just point it out to you here. So the second place award goes to City of Medicine Academy. All righty, ready for the winner? <laughs> Johnson County Early College Team for the Grotesque Grocer. Hang out. We're going to take some pictures here in a minute, right? So we want to thank you guys for participating with us and uh, for all you guys have uh, 
submitted proposals. And once again, thanks for our judges being here. And again, thank you for Cisco Systems uh, sponsoring our contest today. So that ends our program. We're going to take a few pictures with the winners. Thank you for being here.